Technology. And it's my great privilege to welcome all of you to Boston University, to the School of Theology, and to our fourth annual Peter Berger Lecture. Uh, I have the bad news, though, to set, express our regret that our beloved Peter Berger cannot come as of this morning. He was planning to be here, but Mrs. Berger has taken ill. And so please keep them in your thoughts. Um, we will be thinking of them as we celebrate his life and legacy with our distinguished lecturer today, Professor Jose Casanova. To introduce Professor Casanova, we, I'd like to call upon my colleague, Professor Bob Hefner, who's the director of Cura, Cura, which is the chief sponsor of the Peter Berger annual lecture. So without further ado, let me call on Bob to come forward. Thank you. I want to thank everybody uh, for coming. This is uh, always a special event, the annual Peter Berger Lecture. I want to add to uh, Dana's remark about uh, our hearts going out and our concern to Peter and Brigida, who uh, I had spoken, as I mentioned to Professor Casanova, I had spoken with Peter this morning at 9 o'clock, and although he himself had had a mild cold and was concerned about his uh, not being able to come, he had written actually an email and said that he, you, you can't keep me away, I'll be there, and I'll be there for the dinner afterwards. So we were looking to him, looking forward to his joining tonight's events, and unfortunately uh, Brigitte's unexpected, uh, uh, and I'm afraid perhaps serious, uh, turn of health events is, is keeping him away. That's especially uh, lamentable because uh, Peter is a good friend and a longtime admirer of our speaker tonight, as I am as well. Jose Casanova is, and I want to get the title right, uh, he is um, he is the, uh, b -b -b I guess just a professor at Georgetown <laughs> University. <laughs> yeah. uh, but, um, he is truly um, one of the great sociologists of religion of our age. Uh, Peter and I uh, have known him for many years. I think the first event we invited you to was a little thing on civic virtue and civil society back in around 1993. And I discussed Ukraine. And you discussed Ukraine. Did, and you eventually contributed a, a chapter to a volume on democratic civility where he talked about Russian, Ukrainian, and uh, religious tensions in uh, Ukraine. He heads uh, the Berkeley Center at Georgetown University. It's, it's program on globalization, religion, and the secular. If you're not familiar with it, the Berkeley Center, I say this is director of, um, of the Center on Religion and World Affairs, but the Berkeley Center at Georgetown in Washington, D.C is uh, without question, I think, the most interesting, dynamic, and far-reaching of centers on religion and world affairs, not just in the United States, but in the world. And of its very programs, the program on globalization, religion, and the secular, that uh, Jose founded, and that he directs, and whose programs, and conferences, and research projects, and many activities and collaborations around the world. He guides and inspires. That program is, is just a remarkable entity in itself. Um, Jose is perhaps most internationally known for his 1994 work called Public Religions in the Modern World. I think most of the people in this room tonight are familiar with that work, but I'll just say this. Uh, some people might say, if they're not familiar with it, well, was he the first to say that secularization theory in its 1950s and 1960s version has been proved wrong? Religion is alive and well and a major force in public life and politics, which it is. Jose was not the first to say that, but he was the first to say that in a truly sustained, interesting, and complex way one which reminded us that 
rather than the secularization thesis in its kind of, yeah, 1950s version, being wrong, and now we move on and talk about something else, there's a much more complex interplay of forces at work in the world. That is, is that the recognition of and continuing importance of public religion is a reality that takes place not because there is no secularization, but in the form that it does precisely because secularization is a force in contemporary societies, reorganizing all manner of social fields, even as, at the same time, other aspects of social life, other aspects of personal and public comportment remain deeply, and in some instances, more religious than ever. And it was this complex interplay that in that book, and in a series of really stunning publications, that exchanges, I might add, uh, exchanges with figures like Talal Assad, uh, as chronicled, I believe, in the Craig Calhoun book, sponsored by the SSRC, and Jonathan Van Antwerpen book on secularism, as well as in a, a collected, another collected uh, volume, I think also sponsored by the SSRC, on uh, religion, basically on Charles Taylor and religion in a secular age. In these and many, many other works, one sees Jose Casanova in exchange with some of the most critical and important thinkers of religion and world affairs, Al Stepan, if I may add another one of his interlocutors, most important thinkers of our age, and not simply engaging them, but providing the kind of lessons and critical multidisciplinary and globally comparative perspective that no one else can provide with such skill, dexterity, and uh, uh, rhetorical force and theoretical aplomb, if I may call, call it that. I could say much more. He's involved in many projects, many more than the one that he's going to be talking about tonight on the Jesuits as a early example and continuing example of religious globalization. But I won't burden you with that. I think I've said enough. I'll just end by saying thank you all for notwithstanding the snow drifts outside, making your way to this room tonight. But above all, thank you, Jose Casanova, for coming in from Rome to give this fourth annual Peter Berger Lecture. It's a great pleasure to welcome you, and I'm grateful. Thank you very much, Bob, for this very kind and almost embarrassing introduction. But thank you. Um, it's indeed a great pleasure and a great honor to have been invited to deliver the fourth Peter Berger lecture. I was hoping in front of Peter himself. Unfortunately, he cannot be here with us. Uh, many sociologists of my generation got hooked to our discipline reading Peter's invitation to sociology. In my case, the influence was even more personal. Berger and Lukman's The Social Construction of Reality was the first book of sociology I ever read. While studying theology at the University of Innsbruck, Austria, uh, in a course on dogmatic theology and creation, Schöpfung. The professor, Franz Schupp, a young, brilliant Jesuit, uh, the successor of Karl Rahner as the chair of dogmatic theology, was the one who advised me to go to the New School for Social Research, given my interest in classical German sociology, because as he said, if I went to Germany, as I was planning to do, I would end up studying American sociology. He was right. This was before the German scholars, Wolfgang Sluchter, Niklas Luhmann, and Jürgen Habermas reappropriated the work of Max Weber via Talcott Parsons and brought, brought it back to Germany. At the time, Schu thought that Peter Berger was still at the, new school, at the new school. Alas, when I arrived in New York, I learned that Peter had moved to Rutgers University before finding a more permanent home here at Boston University. Only later, after writing Public Religious in the Modern World, did I finally meet Peter, and we have thereafter maintained a very warm personal and intellectual relationship. After reading my own 
auto autobiographical self-reflection, Peter wrote to me, I was struck by the parallels between our two intellectual trajectories, beginning with theological interest in its initiation into sociology, the new school, and then going on to the topics of secularization, modernization, and globalization. Obviously, I was, it was I who followed Peter's trajectory, not the other way around. Indeed, my own lecture today has to be understood as a follow-up to Peter's new book, The Many Altars of Modernity Towards a Paradigm for Religion in a Pluralist Age. That's why I'm so pleased to have the opportunity to present my reflections here today. As Peter added in his message, it seems to me that the difference between our respective approaches are not very big. Indeed, they are not. But it was somewhat boring if I was just to reiterate in my own words those aspects of Peter's new paradigm uh, with which I am basically in agreement, which is probably around 90%. For the sake of argument today, I'm going to focus on those aspects, aspects on which we differ slightly. In my lecture, I would like to present first two friend friendly amendments to the paradigm, and then to develop a long historical footnote and Jesuit encounters with the religious other in early modernity as a kind of complementary addendum to Peter's thesis. Let me make a confession before I begin my more serious dry presentation. There is one gift or charisma I do not share with Peter, namely his extraordinary talent as a, story, as a storyteller and teller of jokes and anecdotes that can provoke redeeming laughter, <laughs> this being the title of one of his per perhaps not so well-known books, which I recommend to all of you. What makes the new book, The Many Altars of Modernity, so wonderful to read is that interspersed within a very sophisticated sociological theory, there are plenty of anecdotes and jokes as very graphic illustrations of the abstract theoretical arguments Peter is seriously developing. I do not know whether most sociologists will find them funny. I did. And so did my wife, who could not stop laughing as I was reading to her out loud the jokes and anecdotes. But as I said, funny storytelling is not among my gifts. So the rest of my presentation is going to be very serious, sociologically dry, but hopefully not too boring. Peter's point of departure, and perhaps the most important insight of his revised thesis is that, quote, the new paradigm should be able to deal with two pluralisms, the coexistence of different religions and the coexistence of religious and secular discourses. This is absolutely crucial. We need an argument which is able to account simultaneously for this dual form of modern pluralism. Religious pluralism on the one hand, that is the emergence of a global system of religions, which I call global denominationalism, and secular religious pluralism on the other, that is the emergence of differentiated but coexisting religious and secular spheres, both in social space and in the minds of individuals. Peter's new paradigm is, in my view, still too much embedded within a theory of Western modernization that views modernity itself as the carrier or catalyst of both types of pluralism, multi-religious pluralism and secular religious pluralism. My argument would be, and this I propose as my first friendly amendment to Peter's thesis, the European modernity is certainly the carrier or catalyst of the second type of modern pluralism, the secular religious one, but not of the first one, multi-religious pluralism. As the exceptional process of European secularization amply demonstrates, modernity per se does not contribute to religious pluralism. We need an additional factor or analytical framework to understand the emergence of a global system of religious pluralism, and this, in my view, has to be a theory of globalization. 
a globalization that both precedes Western secular modernity and continues in an accelerated and transformed manner after Western secular modernity. In other words, global religious pluralization emerges before Western secular modernity in the early modern era of global interreligious encounters that accompanies the European colonial expansion. And then religious pluralization becomes accelerated in our contemporary global age in such a way that it begins to transform in the process also the heartlands of European secularization. We need a theory that is able to encompass the two intertwined historical dynamics or the two European roles of internal modern European secularization and of external global European expansion. It is this external global European expansion that serves as catalyst for the formation of global religious pluralization. European modernity leads to secularization, but not necessarily to religious pluralization. Globalization leads to religious pluralization, but not necessarily to secularization. It is the intertwining of both processes that produces the combination of the two types of pluralism, multi-religious and religious secular. But this intertwining should not be understood as a theoretical necessity, but rather as a contingent historical process that compels us to historicize our sociological theories. This would be my second friendly amendment to Peter's thesis. We need to historicize both our analytical narratives of European modern secularization and our narratives of globalization, which cannot be simply understood is the global expansion of Western secular modernity. Let me say a few words first about the historicization of our narratives of modernization before I move to the other proposal to complement and supplement our theories of modernization with the parallel theory of globalization. We can account better for the rather exceptional European pattern of secular differentiation if we take as the point of departure of our narrative not an ideal typically constructed sacred canopy supposedly shared by all traditional pre-modern societies. We should also avoid ahistorical functional narratives that construct differentiation as a straight linear process from the supposedly religious and differentiated system of medieval Christendom to modern secular societies. In terms of the internal road of European modernization and secularization, our narratives should account for the transformation from the many altars of antiquity, not only the many altars of modernity, but the many altars of antiquity, to the single monotheistic altar of medieval Christendom, to the coexistence of multiple monotheistic altars under the Westphalian system, to the multiple altars of modernity. This is a complex historical development that cannot be easily compressed within the simple binary transition from tradition to modernity. We need to account for the complex transformation from pre-axial polytheism to the axial monotheist distinction between true and false religion to the contemporary global system of religious pluralism. In order to emphasize the intertwinement of the two European roads, the internal one of confessionalization and the external, the external one of global colonial expansion and intercultural encounters with the religious other, I propose that we take 19, excuse me, 1492 as the symbolic date that marks the beginning of both processes. Unlike the symbolic date of 1500 proposed by Charles Taylor as a dividing line between the medieval world of religious enchantment and the modern world of secular disenchantment and pluralization of belief options, which is still framed within traditional paradigms of modernization, 
the date of 1492 serves to complicate both our narratives of Western modernity and our narratives of globalization. On the one hand, 1492 marks the decision of the most Catholic kings to expel Jews and Muslims from Spain in order to create a religiously homogeneous realm. In this respect, it marks also the beginning of the European-wide process of early modern confessionalization of a state, nation, and people based on the principle cuius regio, eius religio, that culminates in the Westphalian system of states. On the other hand, as the date of the discovery of the new world, discovery, of course, in quotation marks, 1492 is also the symbolic marker of the beginning of the European global colonial expansion initiated by the Iberian monarchies. The Iberian colonial expansion made possible the connection of the old world of Afro-Eurasia and the discovered new world of the Americas, linking the East and West Indies, thus forming for the first time one truly global world in novel transatlantic and transpacific exchanges. In this respect, the early modern phase of globalization constitutes literally the first globalization, a form of proto-globalization which can rightly be distinguished from earlier archaic and later modern forms of globalization. Moreover, the early modern reform religion, whether Lutheran, Calvinist, or Catholic, can hardly be understood as traditional taken for granted religion. It was the outcome of a prolonged disciplinary process of confessionalization led by national churches under state sponsorship. This disciplinary process created new types of religiously homogeneous societies throughout continental Europe, a homogeneously Protestant North, a homogeneously Catholic South, and three by confessional societies in between, Holland, Germany, and Switzerland, each characterized by their own patterns of internal territorial confessionalization based on confessional pillars, Landeskirchen, or cantons. In trying to ascertain the relation between modernization, secularization, and religious pluralization, it is important to stress that at least within Europe, the principle cuius regio eius religio remained practically unaltered through the transition from monarchic to national people's sovereignty with the fall of the ancient regimes, or even through the process of massive democratization in the early 20th century. Continental European societies had remained until very recently religiously homo homogeneous societies, and the only significant change had been that from belief to unbelief that is unchurching and an increase in secular religious pluralism, but not in religious pluralism per se. All significant differences notwithstanding, there are many between the Nordic pattern, the Southern pattern, the British pattern, etc. European patterns of secularization share similar paths from homogeneous religion to homogeneous secularity without noticeable dynamics of religious realization other than the more hidden dynamics of religious individuation, which Thomas Luckmann characterized as invisible religion. At the level of individual consciousness, moreover, Europeans tended to experience this process of deconfessionalization and the accompanying individuation as a process of temporal liberation from ascribed confessional identities. Consequently, Europeans tend to experience secularization phenomenologically, not so much as a process of a spatial differentiation within their consciousness of coexisting religious and secular modes, this is Peter's thesis, which would correlate with the differentiation 
of religious and secular fears in society. They experience secularization rather as a historical process of religious decline that is of temporal and a spatial superstition of the religious by the secular. This is the secularist moment of a philosophical conception of history tied to the Enlightenment critique of religion that understands the secular as a post-religious temporal stage. The secular is what comes after religion. Intrinsic to this phenomenological experience is a modern stadial consciousness which understand this anthropocentric change in the conditions of belief as a process of maturation and growth, as a coming of age, and as progressive emancipation. It is this combination of the dynamics of deconfessionalization and this secularist stadial consciousness that, in my view, account best for the unique pattern of European secularization without religious pluralization. Outside of Europe, by contrast, in much of the rest of the world, both the dynamics of confessionalization and deconfessionalization, as well as the secularist stadial consciousness, tend to be absent. What one finds is religious pluralization and religious secular pluralism with milder secularization. To understand the dynamics of religious pluralization, Process of globalization linked to the external road of European colonial expansion are, in my view, more crucial than process of modernization. There is no need to revisit the American system of religious pluralism, so well analyzed by Peter. But it is worth remembering that the American colonies became a refuge for all the religious minorities forced to migrate by the dynamics of ethno-religious cleansing connected with the process of European confessionalization. They also became the home for African religions brought by the transatlantic slave trade. American developments in this respect stand in the crossroads of both dynamics, the external process of globalization and of internal process of modernization, insofar as the American Revolution is intrinsically connected with European enlightenment. But it is important to emphasize that the American state was born as a modern secular state without having to undergo any process of deconfessionalization. There was no Christian state before the American secular state. Moreover, the dual constitutional formula of no establishment and free exercise guaranteed the development of denominationalism as a system of free and open religious pluralism in society based on the sectarian, non-ecclesiastical model of religious association. The legal, the legal, secular principle of formal equality of all denominations tends to undermine not only the traditional distinction between church and sect, the traditional European distinction, but also the one between orthodoxy and heterodoxy, that is, the axial distinction between true and false religion. In this respect, the United States remains the first and paradigmatic case of the simultaneous development of the two types of modern pluralism, religious secular and multi-religious. In order to understand the formation of the modern system of global religious denominationalism, however, it is necessary to go back to the early modern phase of global European current expansion and to follow the encounters between Catholic missionaries that accompany the Iberian conquistadores and non-Western peoples and cultures. With this, I can finally to address the title of my lecture, Jesuit Encounters with the Religious Other. The Jesuits were neither the only nor the first global missionaries. In fact, they follow literally in the steps of older Catholic orders, Franciscans, Dominicans, Augustinians, etc., who had preceded them in colonial Spanish America as well as in Portuguese India. In this respect, the Jesuit global mission was part and parcel 
of the golden, uh, golden age of global Catholic missions that flourished throughout the 16th and 17th centuries, well before the emergence of global Protestant missions, missions towards the end of the 18th century. This is the era when Catholicism attained global reach from East Asia to North America, from the Philippines to South America. Roland Pochiaxia has argued that the centuries of Catholic renewal formed the first period of global history in that the early modern era was shaped both by the encounter between Catholic Europe and the non-Christian world. The Jesuit missionary expansion of the 16th century can only be understood, however, properly if one takes into account the fact that global mission became the specific foundational mission or ministry of the Jesuits from its very inception in a way in which it had not been the case of the mendicant or other Catholic orders. As expressed explicitly in the formula of the Institute, the 1539 Foundational Charter of the Order, Jesuits took an oath, quote, to travel to any part of the world where there was hope for God's greater service and the good of souls in order to minister to the Turks or any other infidels, even those who live in the regions called the Indies or any heretics <coughs> or whatever, or schismatics or any of the faithful. This is the oath which the Jesuits took when they became Jesuits. Global mobility was culturally encoded, as it were, into the makeup of the Jesuit order from its inception. Indeed, no other group took the entire globe as eagerly as the focus of their activities, taking inspiration from Geronimo Nadal's famous slogan, the world is our home. While the iconic image of the Jesuit as itinerant global missionary has persisted, even more enduring has been the parallel image of the Jesuit as resident schoolmaster. In fact, the Jesuits became not only the first Catholic teaching order, but the first transnational professional organization of schoolmasters. The Jesuits play a crucial role in developing a model of humanist liberal arts education, institutionalized in the 1599 Ratio Studiorum, that was to become globalized through an extensive <coughs> network of colleges throughout the world. In fact, it was the virtuous feedback between the global network of Jesuit colleges and the global network of Jesuit missions that made the Jesuits into pioneer globalizers. The Jesuit Catholic missionary impulse had naturally, as a matter of course, the hegemonic purpose of universal conversion to the true Catholic faith. In fact, as is clear from the formula just quoted, the Jesuits initiated their mission with a traditional and customary distinction between the true Christian faith or Catholic religion and all the others, Christian schismatics and heretics, Jewish and Muslim infidels, and the remaining pagan and idolaters. In this respect, this respect, the Jesuits never challenged the discriminatory distinction between true and false religion that was introduced, of course, by the Mosaic distinction. But what makes Jesuit global missionary practices particularly relevant is the fact that under certain circumstances, their controversial method of accommodation took a form which we would call today nativist enculturation. One should, of course, avoid anachronistic interpretations of early modern Jesuit practices from our contemporary global perspective of cultural and religious pluralism. Nevertheless, Balignano's method of accommodation points to a formula of globalization that rejects unidirectional westernization and opens itself to multicultural encounters and reciprocal learning processes. 
This is the famous and controversial formula of Jesuit cultural accommodation, which led to the adoption of the Confucian habitus in China by Matteo Ricci, the Brahmin habitus in India by Roberto de Nobili, the Guarani habitus in the Reducción Reduc de Paraguay, but also the for us today less commendable accommodating habitus of a slave owner in the Jesuit plantations in Brazil or Maryland. It entailed a formula of globalization of Christianity through the particularization of the universal by going local or native through a process of reflexive enculturation and acculturation, which theologically amounts to a formula of ever-renewed Christian incarnation. Even in Spanish colonial America, where conquest, colonization, reduction of the indigenous peoples, and conversion to Christianity were so inextricably intertwined, Jose de Acosta, the famous uh, 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 missionary, Jesuit missionary of Spanish America, already insisted that Hispanization, Hispanization was not necessary to preach the gospel to the Indians, nor to procure their salvation. The Indians could become Christians with becoming Hispanized. It was the differentiation of true universal religion and particular culture as well as then between civilization and idolatry, first introduced by the Jesuits, that allow the various accommodating syntheses of supposedly Christian universalism and cultural particularism. The fact that the method was so vehemently attacked by the other missionary orders, and even by other Jesuits in India and China, before it exploded into the Chinese and Malabar rights controversies in Rome and Paris indicates the extent to which it challenged Eurocentric notions of a uniform Roman Catholic globalization. In some cases, what began as a one-way mission of Christian evangelization that assumed the exclusivity of Christianity as the true religion and the superiority of Christian European culture turned into a mutual intercultural and interreligious encounter that under certain circumstances transformed the missionary as well as the native. The more the Jesuit missionaries were on their own and in the peripheries without the support and protection of the Iberian colonial powers, the more favorable became the circumstances for an open-ended non-hierarchic interaction in a genuine dialogue. Particularly in the encounter with the multifaceted religions of Asia, the old cultural category of pagan, heathen, or infidel began to collapse, and a new plural system of what later would be called world religions began to emerge. Ricci's account of Chinese religion and culture and its reception in Europe was to be particularly relevant. A well-known paragraph from Ricci's 1584 letter to Juan Bautista Roman may serve as illustration. I'm going to translate freely from the Italian, Portuguese, Spanish Creole, frequently used by Jesuits in East Asia. Ricci writes, let me say a few words about the religions and sects of, of China without being too precise since there is no religion in China, and the small amount of cult that exists is so intricate that even their own religious people cannot give a good account of it. So constantly contradicting one word with the other. Leaving aside the Moors, Muslims, which I do not know how they got here, <laughs> the Chinese are divided into three sects. One is called Egya, Buddhist. I mean, I'm not going to go into the Chinese transliteration and how he put it. The other, Chilitan, Taoist, and the most celebrated is, is the one of the literati, who normally do not believe in the immortality of the soul, make fun of the assertions of the other two, and only give, give thanks to heaven and earth for the benefits they receive, but do not pray 
for salvation in the afterlife. In another letter of 1609 to Francesco Passio, a fellow Jesuit, Ricci wrote, in ancient times, they, the Chinese, followed the natural law more faithfully than in our own countries. <coughs> and 1,500 years ago, these people was not inclined to the worship of idols. On the contrary, the books of the literati, which are the most ancient and authoritative among their writings, do not adore anything but heaven and earth and the Lord of both. And if we examine these books, we will find little therein, therein against the light of reason and much that is in conformity with it. And we can hope in divine mercy and that many of their ancient saints were saved by their observance of the natural, natural law with the help that God would have given them on account of their goodness. Now, leaving aside the accuracy of Ritchie's interpretation of Confucianism and his negative view of Buddhism and Taoism, two things become evident from these passages. First, in their encounter with the religious order, the Jesuits are confronted with forms of religious pluralism, which could not easily be fitted with the traditional taxonomies of false pagan or idolatrous religions. Secondly, in their recourse to natural law and the light of reason, in order to account for the nature of this religious pluralism, the Jesuits initiate, in fact, a form of intercultural interreligious encounter that takes place without reference to revelation. In a certain <coughs> sense, one finds here the seeds of the two types of pluralism, multi-religious pluralism and secular religious pluralism. Early modern Jesuits became famous not only as missionaries and court confessors in Europe, but also as mathematicians, astronomers, map makers, land surveyors, and military engineers at the service of royal courts throughout Europe and Asia. Clearly, they had learned to compartmentalize their religious and secular roles within society and within their minds even if their ultimate orientation was ad maiorem dei gloriam, to which they added for the good of souls and the common good. It is the first, probably, Catholic religious order that includes the common good as one of their purposes as they evangelize. Jesuits were to find God in all things and transcendence in the immanent world. Moreover, their method of discernment, learned in the spiritual exercises, helped them to be attuned to the world of the spirit in the midst of the most profane task. I'm using these paragraphs. You may not have read the book, but these are the arguments that uh, Peter Berger makes about the coexistence of the religious secular mind and of the two fields. My point is, that this coexistence is very, very much part of the Jesuit practice in early modernity. It is not surprising that Etienne Pasquier, in his Le Catechism the Jesuit, one of the first works in a long list of anti-Jesuit treatises that will contribute to the Jesuit black legend, characterized them as a hermaphrodite religious order actively engaged in worldly secular affairs. They did not understand the separation of the religious and the secular, he's telling them. This may also have been one of the first French formulations of the strict separation between the world of religion and the world of laicity, 1602. It is undeniable that the Jesuits served as pioneer interlocutors in the religious, cultural, scientific, an artistic encounter between East, East and West and between Old and New World. Particularly, pioneer Jesuits in Japan, China, Tibet, Vietnam, and India play an important role in transmitting and mediating the first knowledge about the foundational texts, religions, 
cultures and civilizations of the Orient, which would later develop into full-fledged academic Orientalism. Jose de Acosta's developmental theory of Amerindian religions, as well as his comparative reflections on Amerindian cultures and the religions and cultures of Asia. Again, there was this dialogue between the Jesuits in Asia and the Jesuits in America, the Jesuits in the Philippines, the Jesuits in, in, in Mexico, and this uh, cultural exchange was going on, not only of discourses, but also of objects and things and ideas. So his theory presented in the Procuranda Indorum Salute, providing salvation to the Indians of 1588, and in his Historia Natural y Moral de las Indias, these two texts mark the point of departure of modern comparative ethnology and anticipate many of the later Eurocentric stadial theories of human development, both being forms of imagining global humanity. In fact, despite their, despite their Christocentric assumptions and their frequent recourse to divine and satanic devices, as explanatory keys to all forms of cultural and religious diversity, the Jesuit early modern imaginary of global humanity and their diapraxis of cultural accommodation and local inculturation appears less Eurocentric, less racist, and less unilinear than later imaginaries associated with the cosmopolitan enlightenment or with the 19th and 20th centuries mission civilatrice and imperial white men's burden. Because they were globalized before European hegemony. They had sense of the superiority of Christianity, but Ritchie was clear that Chinese culture was superior to European culture. And, and there was no association of Christianity yet with modernity. Historically, with their final defeat in the rice controversy at the beginning of the 18th century, the Jesuit accommodating way of proceeding lost the battle within the church and within the wider world. Their ethical contextualism was ridiculed as opportunistic casuistry, casuistry most famously by Pascal. Critics within the church, particularly Dominicans and Franciscans, accused the Jesuits of using a cunning strategy of relativist accommodation that compromised the universality of Christianity. The Eurocentric perspective and uniform romanization prevailed within the church. Externally, the transnational papal order also lost the battle against the triumphant Westphalian model of sovereign territorial states and against the absolutist Catholic kings who one after another, beginning with Portugal in 1759, expelled the Jesuits from their realm and conspired in the papal dissolution of the order in 1773. But over two and nobody complained. Everybody was very happy. It was the final <laughs> solution to get rid of the Jesuits. Protestant, <coughs> Jansenists, Dominicans, all the Catholic kings, and the papal curia all agree the Jesuits have to go. <laughs> but for over two centuries, from the 1540s to the 1760s, no other group contributed so much to the advancement of global connectivity and global consciousness linking the four quadrants of the world. They did it not only through their ubiquitous missions, but through their prodigious production and global circulation of annual letters and edifying mission reports, scientific and ethnographic descriptions, mapping and cartographic exercises, through the construction of numerous scripts, the Vietnamese script is still a Jesuit construction, lexicons and grammars of non-Western languages, through the translation of classical Greek and Latin texts into non-Western languages, and the translation of non-Western classical texts into Latin, through the production of catechisms in every possible vernacular, and through the global circulation of all kinds of objects, from scientific instruments to printing presses and type scripts, from medicinal plants, the so-called 
Jesuit bag or pinine to all kinds of sacred objects, icons and paintings, church architectural styles, music, drama, and ballet. Yes, the Jesuits are the inventors of ballet. French ballet starting the Jesuit college of Louis Le Grand. <coughs> Even the 1689 Russian Treaty of Nerzinsk, the first official diplomatic encounter setting the territorial border between the Chinese and the expanding Russian Empire, was written in Latin and mediated by the Jesuits Tomé Pereira and Jean-François Gervillon with close links to the imperial courts in Peking and Moscow. One must concede that the long history of rather hostile Jesuit encounters with the world of Islam seems to present a clear exception, indeed to contradict the Jesuit method of accommodation as well as their supposedly open attitudes of enculturation and intercultural dialogue vis-a-vis -vis the religion of the other. But in fact, Islam was not so much of an exception if one considers the similar hostile and non-dialogical attitude in Jesuit encounters with Protestant heretics in Europe or with Eastern Christian schismatics in Eastern Europe, Ethiopia, or India. All those are cases of traditional hostile attitude towards well-known religions which would seem to point to the fact that the practice of enculturation into unknown cultures, which share no long histories of mutual prejudices, may in fact have been much easier. But therein lies the relevance of the Jesuit encounters with the religious other in early modernity and the role they play in the formation of a global system of religious pluralism beyond the Western monotheist taxonomies that have been dominant until then. It is only with the modern recognition of the principle of religious freedom as an individual right based on the dignity of the human person that the old religious taxonomy based on the categorical distinction between true and false religion is radically transformed. The old proposition that error has no rights gives way to the proposition that not doctrines, but individuals have rights. Under such a premise, the conditions for authentic interreligious dialogue are also transformed. The Jesuits play an important role in the discovery of those new religions and in their very formation. In a certain sense, all those traditions became first constituted as world religions in this early modern intercultural an interreligious encounter with globalizing Catholicism. I'm not implying that in their method of accommodation in Asia, the Jesuits anticipated the modern principle of religious freedom or religious pluralism. I'm only suggesting that their openness to cultural pluralism within the premises of Christian universalism did contribute through complex ways, which cannot be explored here, to the modern differentiation of religion and culture, as well as to the process of dissociation of Christianity and the secular European culture of the Enlightenment. Obviously, in my presentation today, I could only scratch the surface of a complex development which is gaining increasing attention from the new field of global history. The new interconnected field histories help us to understand the multiple ways in which the internal road of European modernization and secularization and the external road of global colonial expansion were closely intertwined. In this respect, my presentation wanted to offer, as I indicated at the beginning, just a historical footnote to the formation of the modern system of global religious pluralism, so insightfully analyzed by Peter. Thank you very much. Yes, I love questions.
comments, critiques, anything? Yes, please. Chinese expert now, now I'm going to get my feet on fire, no? <laughs> Of course, of course. Now the question is, uh, in the field of global history today, in globalization is that you have a, other one, the globalization of history and the historicization of globalization. And the question, of course, where do you begin? I mean, I myself would say globalization begins actually with the original uh, global settlement of humanity across the globe, right? Only it happened without any form of connectivity or consciousness. And then globalization is the process through which dispersed humanity becomes connected again. Uh, I think there is uh, much to be said that a key turning point in globalization is what is called the axial age, whether we accept the term or not, in terms of this is the beginning of both universal discourses of, global, of humanity, both in terms of ethics, in terms of religion, in terms of, of, of science, logics, but the interesting, question, the interesting thing for me is that this original so-called axial age, relevant is not so much the simultaneity. It's, you know, it's interesting, but not so, but really is the fact that when humanity becomes aware of its universal, it appears in radically four different types. We have radically different four types of universalism. Israeli universalism, Hebrew, Greek universalism, Chinese, and Indian, through Buddhism and others, are radically different versions. And so it speaks for the kind of, or it links to the theory of multiple modernities today. Now, of course, out of the axial age, you could say all kinds of world religions, Buddhism, Christianity, uh, and then out of them, I mean, uh, uh, Judaism, especially through the exile, and then Christianity and Islam, emerged. And all of them somehow already become linked to the thing of the, of the Silk Road, in which precisely all of them were already interconnected, Buddhism and, and the Chinese religions and Christianity and Islam. And certainly before European hegemony, uh, it is the world of Islam that is the center and the uh, major catalyst for the kind of the world system linking Eurasia and Africa, no doubt about it. But then, out of nowhere comes this force of uh, this small peninsula in the West, right, in Europe, that obviously takes over much of what uh, the Islamic globalism had created through military conquest, and then through the link of the old world and new world, expands globalism new dynamic forms. And I think that this is what is, but what is important is precisely of this early modern that it is before European Western hegemony. And what is interesting, if uh, you are probably familiar with my colleague Janet Abelugo before Western hegemony, before European hegemony, before European hegemony. The argument against Wallerstein and the Arab world system theory is that they are centric, global centric, as if globalism has to have one center. The argument now, globalization before happened without being one single center, but it was with multi centers, with multiplicity of dynamics and interconnections, right? And to a certain extent, this is what early modern globalization is, a continuation of the other forms of archaic globalization, but under now truly global conditions. And it's already linked to the emergence of global capitalism, this, after all, uh, the, what is valid of Wall Street, this, and the emergence of the Westphalian system of states that through the global colonial expansion becomes globalized. So the seeds of what later will become Western mo secular modernity through the two main force of capitalism and the Westphalian system of states is already there in the 16th century from the very beginning, accompanying the work of the Jesuits. What makes their work so crucial is precisely that they already serve as catalysts and they're interstitial within the Westphalian system. They are at the same time that they, I mean, they accommodate any type of political regime, the daimyo system in Japan, the imperial system in China, the kingdoms, the tribal kingdoms in Africa, but also all the kingdoms in, in, in Europe, right? They serve as confessors to all the Catholic powers as they are fighting with one another. 
Uh, and, and so in this respect, it is that interstitial character is a transnational global force that is not controlled neither by the nation state nor by the papers that makes this project interesting and controversial. But everybody, after all, there is a, the, the, the black legend of the anti-Jesuit black legend is based on the notion that they are meddling in politics and they are basically a project of an imperial world power, imperial Jesuit republic, right? So there is this image, after all, even the, the famous Monita Secreta will become the mother for the, the elders of Sion, this, this kind of, of conspiracy theory of a world power, secret conspiracy of the Jesuits. So it is the context of a glo the global context that gave the Jesuits uh, a, a kind of a possibility that it was not there in the previous, if you wish, forms of archaic globalization. Also, the uh, administrative structure they developed. There is a very centralized order, and yet, obviously, the center cannot control anything in the peripheries. So it's a, uh, it was Louis Cossard, the sociologist, who wrote a book on the Jesuits as the militant collective, comparing them with the Bolsheviks. But this is a wrong uh, idea. I mean, this notion that the Jesuits are a militant collective, all of them following orders, is not that they are extremely individualist. They are. They are all following uh, the Jesuit way of proceeding, but on their own. You can leave them anywhere in the world without any direction, and they will be Jesuits, and they will somehow do a Jesuit something. Uh, uh, so <laughs> there is uh, 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 a force which emerges, which is already very modern. I mean, we are used to the. Protestant writing of history in which the Jesuits appear basically as a counter-reformation order, although the counter-reformation only appears very, very late. I mean, at first, Ignatius had no interest whatsoever in the Protestants. They didn't even want to send his, his Jesuits to the Council of Trent. But later, of course, they become a very important anti-Protestant force in, in Europe. But this only comes much later. They are really interested in the globe, not in European religious wars, although they become very much embedded in the religious wars. So it is the opportunity structures of uh, the global particularly very global expansion together I would argue with the Catholic renewal that precedes uh, the Protestant Reformation certainly in Spain and Italy and that's why it cannot simply be called counter-reformation and of course the kind of Christian universalist humanism that they develop that is uh, linked to the school of Salamanca and the, the international law the later will be secularized by Grotius and others, but that's very important in their construction of a model of the globe and of a free global civil society, which is not controlled by any power. And therefore, the, the, if you have a project of global evangelization, you have to have a model of an open global civil society with everybody the right to go and to enter. But of course, without force. And this was the big debates with, among the Jesuits, as you know, between Sanchez and Acosta whether uh, the Spaniards should use military force to force the Chinese to open up the, 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 the Chinese walls for Christian evangelization. And the arguments are the same arguments that we hear between the neocons, whether you should bring force to bring democracy, to bring salvation, to bring freedom to the people. Basically, all these arguments were precisely repeated there among the Jesuits. Which kind of global order should we have and can we have? And so in this respect, what is interesting about they are, they, they are local. They are in the global and local, and they are dynamics of both universalism and particularism. We're still struggling with the same issues that they were struggling. It's interesting, I mean, 40 years ago, nobody was interested in the Jesuits. Today, there's a huge explosion of interest in early modern historians. And anybody writing global history, you meet them everywhere. But it is because we, we have this center, our conception of Western modernity, where now, with a global orientation, those who have been left behind by the progress of history suddenly have come back as, as pioneers of uh, an age that has something to tell us. So this is what is interesting, I think, about the modern. Yes. I have two some unrelated questions. Uh, you uh, use 1492 as a point of departure. It's a probability. Uh, right. Uh, I, wonder, I wonder if you could look back in the pre-1492 period in Cordoba, for example. Well, but this is the point, this is the right. point. And, and I wonder if you would see that kind of, those kinds of conceptions of pluralism as being different from the ones that the Jesuits are promoting, for example, in China and elsewhere. That's one question. 
the other is that uh, moving forward to the 19th century, now the Jesuits did go into the Middle East and they did become involved. Was there a difference in your view in the attitudes of the mind this time around compared to the earlier uh, missions uh, by the Jesuits? Those are two what are very important, those are very important questions. Actually. Obviously there was a model of convivencia. That means the possibility of precisely. So there was a model of pre modern religious pluralism, yeah. which is cut by the process of confessionalization right. everywhere. And so this is, it is this idea of cuius regius religio that makes the religious wars basically inevitable. Because nobody believes in the possibility of multiple Christianities living together. So before you will have Christianity, I mean, Islam and Judaism, but the idea of having multiple Christianities being living together in peace is simply unthinkable. Nobody, even those who want to promote peace, think that somehow uh, 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 multiple Christianity is not uh, simply possible. How right. Were, so how aware were they of this pre-1492? Uh, well, many people were. Many people were. The Jesuits. Some people. The Jesuits, yeah. when it comes to Judaism and Islam, uh, the Jesuits are very philo-Semitic, particularly. And a lot of, of the early Jesuits from Spain were new Christians. So there's a very, very close uh, you know, a very book, book about the Jesuits as the kind of synagogue. Uh, so you have uh, the, the counter, not the black legend, but the one that makes them into good guys. Uh, they were aware, but um, it's not so central. After all, Ignatius was already lives in a context in which uh, uh, already the negative uh, kind of views of Islam are so uh, entrenched, basically they cannot free themselves from the, from the European anti Islamophobia and anti Islamic view. So, in this way, they are, they are children of their time. With respect to Islam, even when they come to the Mughal Emperor in India and so on, they are still. Uh, 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 I mean, they realize there's a different Islam they encounter there. The next question, of course, is very interesting because when the Jesuits are restored in 18, in 19, excuse me, in 1814, they really come back as the papal members. But they had an individual, autonomous, if you an autonomous project of their own. That they were neither the lackeys of the royal of the kings, Catholic monarchs, nor of the papacy. Now they are really the carriers of the project of global romanization. So now their project, the, the project of the papacy and the Jesuits are one and the same. They're actually the defenders of pa the papacy against modernity, against liberalism, against nationalism. So they are at the same time probably more global than anybody else. They are still. Probably nobody else is as global as they go because they are thrown out of every country. So they cannot be they cannot be staying anywhere. They are constantly on the move because they are thrown out by all the liberal regimes. And out of America, especially, they, they come back, they come to the United States, they find refuge here. And from here they begin their global missions everywhere. But they go now with a very different mindset. They are not anymore in any way pioneers of a kind of uh, they are now a rear guard against the, the hegemonic force of globalization. And it's only when we're in the 1960s again that now a new change, a new refoundation of the order, which once again they want to be at the margin, and the peripheries. So their point is not, if you wish, to bring the native to the center, but actually to protect, if you wish, the native from the uh, negative force of globalization. If you wish, it's the, the, the unthinkable, the, the idea that the Pope could, that the Jesuit could be a Pope was unthinkable. It's very interesting that there has been no anti-Jesuit uh, uh, reaction to it. This in itself is a very interesting aspect. But so there has been a, so one could argue there have been three different types of Jesuit orders. The one from foundation to uh, suppression, the one restoration to 96, the new refoundation. But this is, I mean, even somebody like John O'Malley, <coughs> the Jesuit historian, basically uh, uses such a thesis. So much. I was wondering whether this Jesuit encounter with the other religious other produced any sort of you know coherent structural understanding of looking at the plurality within Christianity, both uh, in its sort of Catholic version and, and later on. But if that sort of you know priesthood, there is any kind of sustained perspective towards looking at diversity within um, Christianity. Diversity within the true Catholic faith, yes but not diversity of acceptance of heretics. And they want to basically bring the Eastern Christians. I mean, they are the ones that begin the, uni, the, uni, the union of breasts, trying to, 
ecumenical dialogue with uh, uh, Eastern Christianity in Polish Lutheran Commonwealth, and also the Maronites in the Middle East. So they are those or, but their encounter, for instance, with the Ethiopian Copts is very, very negative. Their encounter with the Thomas Kirk and the Thomas Church in India is also very negative. But they have a model. Basically, they, you could argue they view themselves as, as the way that Paul is the evangelizer to the Gentiles. In the same way that basically Paul uh, goes to the Aropagos and talks to them about their non God. And so they view themselves in many ways the same way that Christianity that was originally Hebrew freed itself from Hebrew culture to become Hellenic and Latin and became again reincarnated. So the idea is that Christianity becomes universal but becoming particular everywhere. And so it is a, it is a, a model for plurality, but within one Catholic faith. So it's not pluralism of acceptance of plural Christianity, but within the Catholic faith, not a Romanized, centralized Catholic church, but one that has many very different local churches. Which you could say is the project, the model of, of, of Francis today. Um, but not a particular sort of uh, towards the other orders. Or what they are. The other orders, of course, they are always fighting. I mean, Dominican Franciscans, they were fighting, and then both of the Dominican and Franciscans hated the Jesuits. So, so they, they, they are. Uh, but this is part of the Catholic pluralism, right? This is precisely. This is, as long as you have orders, this is when you have a Romanization through diocesan priests and episcopal control that homogenization happens. As long as you have a lot of religious orders, each of them has its own particularity. And you have pluralism within the church. Hi, um, just a a question or note on your footnote, uh, sort of a footnote. Your quote from Ricci was very interesting to me because you say there's some kind of contradiction. There's no religion in China. It seems to be part of the contribution of these missionaries in thinking about religious pluralism is actually the application or the beginning of the crack in the use of the word religion right. to these different right. sects, right. because they're really just superstition, often, like the Philippines or some parts of America. So just using the word religion applied, and I'm looking in particular at Buddhism, is already a step toward this kind of pluralization, because religion, that term is not applied very often in early modern. And they themselves, I mean, here in this, in this quote, he uses religion and he uses law. Right. Law, faith, religion, they are still use. Um, of course, you know, this is one of the contemporary debates in the last 40 years. It's moving from a model of religion, something very primitive and traditional that disappears with modernity, was something which actually emerges in early modernity. It was, of course, uh, uh, Calvin Smith who, who argued that actually they both, the category of religion in the singular and the category of religion that emerges precisely in the 16th, 17th century. Now, in his case, it's more within Europe. So you have two uh, models of the emergence of the category of religion and religions. One is the pluralization of Christianity, the religious wars, and then the secular construction of religion in the singular is something bad. Which so this is, this is one. But my argument is that there is another one that also looks at a religion as something which is universally human, and the pluralization of religions, which is this other. And this is a critique to what otherwise would be the theories of my colleagues, basically Tavalas and another, that basically uh, uh, impute that it is secular reason, modern secular reason that constructs the category of religion. So it's a, in this respect, it's a footnote also to the debates about the origins of the category of religion right. and how problematic. We, we need to, to have much more complex sure, sure. Histori historicized theories. Two points. Well, could you uh, could you just repeat, since I know several people in the audience would appreciate an expansion on your your comment about Assad and the emergence of the category of the religious? So you could just repeat that, and perhaps throw a few additional sentences in that direction. I think it'd be very helpful to some of the people with whom uh, I am in dialogue in this room. But my my question, more substantially, uh, has to do with a very different part of your paper. Uh, which I thought was just excellent. Uh, unfortunately, few of you I know in the room are familiar with uh, Peter Berger's new book, and, which is a book about different types of pluralities, uh, different challenges of coexistence. 
building an effect on a critique of his own work, his own early work, which he's repudiated, which sort of puts a central focus as regards pluralism as to how people of different faiths and ethical traditions live together. Now adding, criticizing that is too simple and recognizing, Peter argues, that a key feature of modernity in the modern era we now understand is that religion's going nowhere, well no one, no surprise there. Religious diversity is going to remain very strong and very vibrant all around the world as Jose's work demonstrates very well. But the new addition in Peter's argument, and this is what I wanted to ask you about Jose, is this is Peter's insistence, much stronger insistence than he or most, with the possible exception of, of Jose, most sociologists and scholars of religious plurality have recognized his insistence that really one of the sort of most severe challenges of our modern life is the simple is not the juxtaposition of diverse religions, but the the juxtaposition of a kind of strong secularism, a strong non-religious worldview with religious worldviews. And it's on this that I want to ask my question. Here's my question, because I, I didn't hear, because I don't think it was the focus of your talk, but it may also be because perhaps the Jesuits had less to say about this. Though you, you credited the Jesuits, I think, in a very compelling way with making with demonstrating the compatibility of faith with secular reason, science, uh, geometry, all manner of things. I didn't hear whether they actually developed a normative discourse and an ethical justification that in an articulate way defended the importance of a reason that is secular on the part of people who are religious. And I, I, I could hear, for, and I, I'm assuming that they did, but I could, and I could hear references to that, I thought, in your paper. But in his, and, and obviously you have a lot going on in this project, so this, this is just an observation and, a, and an invitation for you to add something more from the larger project. But in short, in as much as Peter has, is now focusing very interestingly on the fact that the, the real challenge is not just religious diversity, but a very, very strong secularism coexistent with religious diversity. Can you say a little bit more about how the Jesuits thought that challenge through in light of their commitment to a secular reason in certain, the limited, and I presume highly circumscribed, social field? Well, to call it secular vision at the time, it would not be secular in the sense in which we understand secular today. Right. Uh, they were within a, a, a conception of categories of natural law and universal reason. So they accept simply, they take for granted the universal quality of all humans. I mean, they basically reject on the base. But this is what the school of Salamanca, the second school, the promise that rejects some aspects of Thomism, especially rejects some aspects of Aristotelianism, Aristotelianism and has a much more open-ended uh, conception of law and humanity. Uh, which is linked to uh, the fact that any individual uh, uh, can become, is called to become a Christian, therefore uh, is uh, basically as uh, equal to any other Christian. So in this respect, Christian universalism is what allows these other possibilities in their view. However, they assume precisely that with an, um, without revelation, I mean this quote from Ritzi also about the saints be going to heaven, uh, without being members of the church and without having heard of Jesus Christ. Of course, is the notion of, if you wish, implicit Christians that a modern theologian like, like Runner would develop, which simply assumes that again. So after all then, uh, it's not necessary then to be saved by Jesus Christ. So this puts into question a lot of, uh, so, and only through a, a kind of a Trinitarian theology they are able to, to link it. Now, Secular, I wouldn't call it secular in this respect. Uh, what is clear is that they don't see any problem. As I said, they simply, uh, this uh, 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 spatial separation of living together, intertwinement of what could be called the sacred and the profane, the religion and the secular, is no problem for the Jesuits. And that's what everybody sees them as problematic. Because they say, guys, these people claim to be religious, but they are so involved in business, they're so involved in politics, they're so involved in every secular agenda, in worldly. 
let's call it worldly matters, right, in the world. Um, but I wouldn't argue that they have a notion of a secular state which is neutral and that loves religious pluralism. This is something which only emerges really in the, with the Enlightenment in the, in the 19th century. But, but, just but, but they accept that, uh, again, in the debates about the world order, they don't have an idea of one single type of political order that should be shared by everybody. They simply take for, for granted cultural, political, economic pluralism. And within it, then, there is a universal humanity and universal access to global civil society, uh, uh, but uh, not necessarily a model of kind of a project of a secular vision or something like this. Is, they don't have it. But it's, if I could just follow that very quickly. So I, what I'm curious about is whether there's something that in some vague way anticipates <coughs> A Schutzian distinction between different kinds of reasons. Reasons they do, they do. that operate in light of very different postulates to the nature of the reality and the language and theoretical practices in which one can engage operating within that realm so that sciences, for example, given a certain measure of autonomy and allowed uh, uh, to, to conform to something other than the dictates of revelation. They are not uh, uh, true reflexive theories. They are really, uh, they are contemplatives in action. They are really, uh, so they have, the diapraxis is what leads to, so it's not so much the theories they have, but the praxis that had that they point to these possibilities. But I don't think that you can argue that they have a proto-theory of these kind of things. I mean, Suarez would be the closest thing to a, a theologian that begins to think about these matters in a kind of a systematic way. And somebody who will have a tremendous, I mean, be influenced on the secular development of Grotius on the one hand, and, and, and German philosophy on the other. But he still remains within the scholastic kind of theology. And, uh, uh, and it's obviously uh, referred to Aristotelianism but non or Thomism, but nonetheless, uh, it's still within the tradition of natural law. I, I was curious as to whether there's any resource here for uh, contributing to moral arguments against the transatlantic slave trade, which was pretty... Very, very little, and this is what is striking. I mean, they do, some of them do. Vieira in, 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 in Brazil, really one of the important critics. But by no means, of course, we know that even... So they are the defenders of the Indian, no doubt about it. Against the slavery of Indians, they are extremely strong. They protect the indigenous people. But they are less, less uh, so clearly committed to the protection of uh, 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 African slaves from oppression. And they are, they, they said, the slave owners. I mean, one of the paradoxes of their colleges is that precisely because they charge no tuition for education, is the first. They establish colleges for anybody, education for anybody. They need to rely on, so are the first fundraisers. They have to rely either on secular business, then finances their colleges, or fundraising to widows and, to, and so. Much of the of the black ledges against the city has to do with the kind of the financial dealings they have to do to support their colleges, since they charge no tuition. And one of them is, especially in the in the Americas, around every college we have basically uh, a slave plantation that finances the college. So, and in Maryland, they are uh, the largest slave owners. In Maryland, they are very nice, patristic, I mean, patriarchal slave owners, but nonetheless slave owners. And they, and they, they are, they play a terrible role in, when they actually uh, 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 emancipate uh, uh, the slaves, they actually, uh, uh, actually, when they get rid of the slaves, they sell them rather than free them. So, when they want to, because they've been saying, this is a burden for us. We shouldn't do it. It's not just. But even then, they sell the slaves. So, so I'm not going to say that they are nice, nice all around. They are brothers with them at this point. Jose, can you um, map out the areas of activity of Latin America? You mentioned Maryland, um, also China. Where were, um, which colonial powers, powers did they follow? Where were their activities restricted? Also, were they expelled from China at a certain point also? Yeah, they were expelled from everywhere. Yeah. Uh, I mean, Japan is the first place where they are really successful. The first really successful Jesuit 
mission is Japan, over 100,000 uh, Christian Japanese. And it's the first place in which basically Japan uh, realizes that we have to get rid of the Jesuits and close ourselves from westernization. So Japan, I mean, the Jesuits are the symbol of the threat of West colonial and westernization. And the paradox is that they, they try to free themselves. So to map out, obviously, it is the Padroado Real. The Portuguese are the sponsors of the, of the global Jesuit missions. The Spaniards come only much late. Philip II doesn't like them. To the Spanish America, they come very, very late when all the other orders have taken over. But in uh, uh, Portuguese India, in Portuguese Africa, in Portuguese Brazil, those are basically Jesuit colonies. It's the Jesuits that do Christianization. But then the other thing is, and they go where the Portuguese go as traders to Japan, to Macau. But where the Portuguese cannot enter, the Japanese enter by becoming Japanese, or the Jesuits by becoming Japanese, in China by becoming Chinese, right? So they go then, and they are the only Europeans alone in China, the Jesuits, for, for, for many decades, right? And the same goes, so there is, and in, in Latin America, in Spanish America, uh, when they go, all the places have taken over, and they have two niches, the colleges, they establish this college in every major town through Mexico, Peru, all the way. And of course, then the Indian, the indigenous reductions in the frontiers. So they, they play a role in the frontiers of the Iberian empires, and especially the reductions of Paraguay is a protection of the Guaranis against the slave raiders from Sao Paulo. And they, even they move their, their reductions to protect them from the slave raiders. And this is, a, uh, this is something which, uh, obviously, they help the Spanish kings against, the, uh, against Portugal for a while, but then this becomes part of the conflict. And eventually, when the, when the, when the, uh, the, the Spanish and Portuguese kings, the Treaty of Madrid, uh, basically redraw the boundaries, they cut the reductions in two, and then the Guaranis began a rebellion which basically the king said the Jesuits have started the rebellion, they are not loyal subjects. So the expulsion of Portugal comes from after the Guarani rebellion. China is the most interesting case, because in China is where you have all the conflicts of globalization, the three projects of Catholic globalization, the national one of kings, the Portuguese versus the French. So the French, Louis XIV sends the French mathematicians, Jesuits, to basically take over the missions from the Portuguese, from the Italians. So it's a big conflict between uh, French Catholicism and Portuguese Catholicism, where the Jesuits will be. And then the Pope wants to take over the missions from both, from the Jesuits and from, from the uh, uh, Catholic kings, by establishing the propaganda fide in the 1620s, precisely to create uh, global Roman missions controlled by the papacy, not by the Jesuits or by the kings. And the Jesuits are caught in between the, the, the uh, uh, Kangxi emperor. So those are my Jesuits. And they, are, they accept the, the, the Chinese rights. And as long as they accept the Chinese rights, I protect them. The Pope says, no, you have to give up the rights. So there's a big fight between the Pope and, 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 and the emperor over the Jesuits, who owns them. And I don't like the fight over the, the Catholic Church today in China, whether it should be a patriotic national church or one controlled by, 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 by Rome. So those issues, they are, uh, obviously, they, uh, they are uh, 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 helpers of Iberian colonization. These are the ones that help the two Iberian colonial powers. Also, Bavaria would be similar, for example, uh, uh, in financing their missions everywhere, also Bavaria. Bayern. But they are always on their own. They always go beyond. They are always go beyond where European colonial powers cannot come. And they is there. Where they go on their own is where the real intercultural encounters. Because they don't come as European hegemony. They come precisely. And they, they only are accepted because they themselves enculturate, become, I mean, you know, Ricci basically is accepted as a major uh, literati. Right? His books are written by the other literati. And he's, uh, basically he's a, he becomes a very famous if you wish Confucian a scholar, try to convince the Chinese, you have forgotten the real Confucianism. I'm going to teach you Confucianism. And for a while, it's very successful. I mean, in, in, in this attempt to teach the Chinese that I know you are Confucianism better than you. And, and, and so there is um, the same thing was with, with Nobile in Madura, not in Goa. In Goa is part of the Iberian colonial uh, place. But in Madura, there is there are no Portuguese. And Nobile simply becomes a Brahman, right? Dresses like a Brahman, eats like a Brahman. Of course, means then that you follow the caste system like a Brahman. 
is of course the other, the, the Franciscans and Dominicans, which kind of Christian are you that accepts the caste system and you don't accept the universal uh, equality of, of humans as well. So there are a lot of problems with accommodation because it, it, accommodation means also accepting too much of the baggage of the culture and much of the critique of the Franciscans and Dominicans has to do with the elites. The, the, this method of accommodation is also to which extent it's an instrument to convert the emperor in order then to evangelize. So there are questions about the method and how much it is a, a kind of a, an instrument of uh, power. Yes, Nancy. Hello, Jose. Hola. I was so nice fascinated you. with your, your two sort of prime moving forces of the colonialism and confessionalism. And, and one, in some sense, as I understand your argument, confessionalism essentially moving against pluralism and uh, colonialism uh, toward pluralism. And fascinated with the way you talked about how those two forces had an impact in this country, in North America. And if I'm hearing your argument right, a, a really fascinating way in which we're, because we had refugees from confessionalism, confessionalism ironically produces pluralism. Uh, in, right, here, here, here. Exactly. The older uh, minorities find the right. And the colonialism right. produces the pluralism also right. by introducing the African. Right, right. and of course, and the fact that they are already, colonialism, wherever it gets, are already people there. Which, right. So religious, plural, religious plurality is a fact of life wherever the Europeans come. And they have to come to terms. So the kind of homogenization that they impose uh, in Europe cannot serve as a mother anywhere. And we know the problem with the attempt to recreate in the homogeneous nation state <coughs> through the globalization of the nation state, the catastrophes it creates, ethno-religious <coughs> means at all. Every time you have a mother nation state, reproduces the ethno-religious cleansing. After the Ottoman Empire, you know, Israel, everywhere. You know, basically the model of a homogeneous uh, uh, ethnic nation state or uh, religious state and, and, and it reproduces the, the, the password. I think that feels like the moment. It's uh, it's an hour and forty five minutes. However, if one person wants to ask the last question, I always think it's a it, it's a good thing to have a final word from them. us from the audience. Does anybody want to pose a final question, or otherwise not make me look like a fool? <laughs> what about the Jesuits here? <laughs> Please. Yeah, the Jesuits in the room, thank you for this. <laughs> 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 the Jesuits in the room, that's fine, I'm not sure. You like with the hand or not? <laughs> yes, I, I think you, you were right in, in, in the way you, you divided the, the, the global development of the Society of Jesus. Uh, and the Ethiopian case you talk about uh, is reflective of that kind of evolution when you read the letter of St. Ignatius in his lifetime to the natives of Ethiopia, they are more inclusive. Um, a, a, a man like Pedro Pais, who was a leading missionary there, would be like a Francis Xavier for the Ethiopians, uh, encouraging uh, uh, his way of doing mission. But at the same time, after Trent, and I think this is a point you can focus a little bit, there is a radical change in this global approach of mission uh, because one of uh, the things that happened in Trent is uh, the kind of romanization of Catholic missions, including the Jesuits. And we will see that change in Ethiopia, particularly when after Pedro Pius, you will have uh, Mendes arriving as a Roman uh, representative <coughs> there to impose the Catholic Church to Ethiopia. So uh, I just wanted to... I'm not sure it is trend that does it, because trend is really, really a force within the <coughs> renovation of Catholic Christianity. But actually, for the Jesuits themselves are the ones that begin the missions in Europe to Christianize the indigenous. They say, this is our Indians. We don't need to go to the Indies because our Indies are here, and there is, is you have as many idolaters and not Christians here, let's say, in all over Europe. 
so there is a back and forth between the missions. Uh, they are missionaries, and most Jesuits remain missionaries in Europe, not in the Gulf. Many of them go. Um, Trent is, for instance, Jose de Acosta, which I mentioned as a key figure in Latin America. He was the one that is a crucial figure in the Council of Lima that is called the Latin American Trent. And out of it came the three catechisms, the catechism in Spanish, in Aymara, and in uh, uh, Quechua. And the idea again being that, you know, Indians don't need to learn Spanish to be uh, catechized. We can, we can make them Christians, we can make them Spanish. Now, Ethiopia is uh, 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 one of the cases in which very clearly the prejudices against Eastern schismatics and the inability of the Jesuits to accept other forms of Christianity than the one of the Pope is very clear. But the same what happens with the with the church in the Thomas Church in India, in Kerala. Uh, they are very good with the Brahmins. They are not so good with the Indian Christians, with the, with the Syrian Church in India. So uh, it's not, and I don't think that it is, has to do with trend so much. I mean, because we are used to understand Trent is the counter-reformation, the kind of, uh, I don't think that in the terms of the global discourse, Trent is that relevant. Certainly, all the, the, Chinese, in, the Chinese missions and the, and the Indian missions will come well after Trent. I mean, there's a really, we are talking here of the end of the, ninth, of the 16th century, beginning of the 17th century. And all of those are uh, actually uh, Jesuits that studied in the Colegio Romano precisely in the 50s and 60s after, I mean, the 60s after Trent. So it's not, uh, so those are the, the great uh, uh, um, uh, accommodators, Jesuits, rich in nobility. Those are products of the Colegio Romano after Trent. So they are really study, study there in the, in the 60s, 70s before going to go on to India, to China. So I wouldn't put that the, the, the transformation of the Jesuits after Trent is so, so relevant. The, the, the negative developments, I think, in Ethiopia can be explained in terms of the hardening of attitude towards the so-called Christian schismatics. And this happened also in the polish Lithuanian Commonwealth. It happens also there, vis-a-vis -vis the, the, the Orthodox and vis-a-vis -vis even the Uniate, uh, 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 which at first begins as a project of ecumenism, later hardens into a much more one of uh, uh, unity, discipline. So. I think that what you're saying about Ethiopia is right, but I wouldn't attribute it to Trent. But maybe I'm wrong. Maybe you know a bit better than I. I, I, I don't know the story of Ethiopia as well, probably, as you do. I know that what you are say, talking about, uh, I think you are right, but uh, I don't think that it is due to Trent. Yeah. But, but maybe you're right. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, <clears throat> I want to thank everybody again for uh, this very cold winter night uh, coming out and joining us to welcome a gentleman and a scholar and a friend who I hope all of you will agree warmed perhaps at least a little both body and mind of many of us tonight. So join with me please in thanking him.